Dr. Roberto Goitzueda is Professor Emeritus of Boston College. While at BC, he was the Margaret O'Brien Flatley Professor of Catholic Theology and Director of the Undergraduate Program in Theology. He is a former president of the Catholic Theological Association of America and has degrees from Yale and Marquette universities. Roberto elegantly guides his students and his friends through landscapes of theology and culture, theological aesthetics, Christology, and U.S. Latino and Latina theologies. I know Roberto best from our service together on the board of St. Thomas More Catholic Chapel and Center at Yale University. Roberto was a friend and an inspiration to Father Bob Boulogne, the Catholic chaplain at Yale, and to me in our collective work to bring a Catholic intellectual and spiritual center of consequence to fruition. Through this work, we met Elizabeth, his wife, and their children, all of whom were very dear to Father Bob, particularly in his final year of life. Parenthetically, Yale was also where I first met our dear Henry Nowen. What a joy to be participating in this celebration. If you have ever had the privilege of hearing Roberto deliver a lecture, then you know you are in for an exquisite treat today. His insights and imagery, his quiet faith, his formidable intellect, and his palpable goodness and integrity conspire to magnificent effect. Please welcome my friend, the erudite Roberto Goitzueda. Let me begin by saying how grateful I am to have this opportunity to be present with you to, uh, today. Um, I'm really grateful to Karen and the Henry Nowen Society uh, for this honor, uh, and I consider it an honor. Henry Nowen has been somebody who has accompanied me uh, for many years as a spiritual guide uh, in my life. And, um, and so when I was invited, when Karen invited me to be present and to participate in this way, I jumped at the chance just as, a, as an expression of my gratitude to Henry Nowen for for uh, the, the role that he's played in my own spiritual and theological development over the years. And so what I'd like to do today is to simply share with you some reflections on, on uh, Henry Nouwen's, uh, uh, the, the importance that, that I think liberation theology has played in, uh, or did play in his, in his life and in his writings, and conversely, uh, what Henry uh, can contribute to our understanding of liberation theology, particularly the roots, the foundations of liberation theology, as, at least as I understand them. So uh, again, I'm very grateful for this opportunity. In 1981 and 1982, Henry Nouwen spent six months in Bolivia and Peru. He traveled there in search of an answer to the question, does God call me to live and work in Latin America in the years to come? In 1983, his reflections on that experience would be memorialized in his book, Gracias. Ten years later, in 1993, Nouwen recounted how that initial vocational question had been answered in the decade since his Latin American sojourn. As it turned out, he reminisced, that question found an answer, but in a very different way than I had expected, he said. Today, I do not live in Latin America, but in Toronto as pastor of the large daybreak community where the mentally handicapped and their assistants make a home for each other and try to live in the spirit of the Beatitudes. While in Peru, he was introduced to liberation theology and the option for the poor. It was there in Peru, he continued, that I discovered for the first time that those who are marginalized by our society carry within them a great treasure for the church. There he discovered that the deepest desire of his own heart was, quote, the desire to find a home among God's poor, unquote. If it was not to be the poor of Latin America, it would be the marginalized, mentally poor per persons of the Larsh community. At L'Arche, he would discover, quote, a life 
where the gifts of the poor can be revealed and given to the church, unquote. Though on the surface, Lima and Toronto were literally a world apart, they were united by the communities of the poor Henry had encountered in each, the campesinos of Peru and the members of the large community in Canada. What's revealed in Nouwen's journals of this period is a profound understanding of the spiritual foundations of the liberation theology he had encountered in Peru. Henry understood almost instinctively that for all its emphasis on social action and political liberation, as important as that emphasis was and is, certainly, the foundation of liberation theology and the preferential option for the poor is ultimately the simple evangelical proposition that God loved us first. And he understood that that's the greatest gift, that whether in Lima or Toronto, the poor the vulnerable, the marginalized, and wounded can give to our church and to our world. Henry had already written a great deal about the great human need to be loved unconditionally and the centrality of Christ as the divine response to that human need. In the poor of Peru and Larsh, he discovered the human sacraments of that divine response. He discovered the crucified Christ revealed in the lives and the deaths of God's crucified people. Henry came to understand the deep integral connection between our ability to receive God's unconditional love in our own individual lives and our social solidarity with the poor. He came to understand the integral connection between mysticism or union with God and social transformation. For the Christian, these are but two sides of the same coin. We cannot receive God's unconditional love as embodied in the crucified and risen Christ without also receiving the poor in our midst, and vice versa. It's this connection that's the central insight of liberation theology. It's this connection to which I'd now like to turn. At the heart of Henry Nouwen's life, work, and writing is the central conviction that each one of us is the beloved child of God. Indeed, this is the good news at the heart of the gospel. Yet paradoxically, this good news is revealed to us only if and when we acknowledge our common mortality and embrace our fundamental powerlessness in the face of death. Seeing Christ in the poor, writes Nouwen, is only possible when that same Christ has found a place in our own heart. And the only place in our heart where Christ can dwell is the place of weakness. Thus, fear of powerlessness is the greatest obstacle to Christian faith. For now, in this fear of our own woundedness has a social face, i.e. a fear of those vulnerable and wounded persons in our society whose very existence reminds us of our common vulnerability in the face of death. We so much want to be different, Henry reflected. But the great news is that the one who was totally other became totally the same. In our obsessive desire to live as if we were never going to die, we deny our humanity, and therefore we deny the God who chose sameness over difference. As the Apostle Paul reminds us in the famous Philippians hymn, though he was in the form of God, Christ emptied himself to become the same as us. And yet, we ourselves pretend that we can escape that sameness, that we can somehow evade our common destiny, if only we're wealthy enough, powerful enough, healthy enough, or secure enough. By confronting us with the fact that in the face of death, we're all in the same boat. The poor and marginalized represent a fundamental threat to our illusory quest for invulnerability, security, and control. Therefore, we must hide them from view. We must put them behind walls or bars, get them off the streets, or if all else fails, we must eradicate them. Only then can we continue to live in the illusion that we, 
are not like them. The Christian's preferential option for the poor is thus much more than an ethical imperative derived from our faith. We do not love the poor because we are Christians. We are Christians because we love the poor. Since the poor reveal to us that common mortality or common powerlessness, which is the precondition for our receptivity to God's utterly gratuitous, unconditional love. Our hatred and fear of the poor is rooted in our self-hatred. Our fear of our fundamental contingency as mortal creatures. Conversely, the liberation of the poor is a precondition for our own liberation. As Henry wrote in his book, Gracias, quote, everyone shares the handicap of mortality. Our individual physical, emotional, and physical failures and spiritual failures are but symptoms of this disease. Only when we use these symptoms of mortality to form a fellowship of the weak can hope emerge. It is in the confession of our brokenness that the real strength of new and everlasting life can be affirmed and made visible." Unquote. Nouwen's many writings brilliantly lay bare this dynamic between self-hatred, hatred of the other, and receptivity to God's unconditional love in the person of the crucified and risen Christ. In so doing, his writings make clear the intrinsic relationship between what Peruvian theologian Gustavo Gutierrez calls the two principal themes of the scriptures. First, the universality and gratuity of God's love. And secondly, God's preferential love for the poor. God's preferential love for the poor safeguards and, and guarantees the utter gratuity and universality of that love. And that intrinsic integral connection is revealed in the spirituality of the poor, which is the foundation of liberation theology. Señor, me has mirado los ojos, sonriendo has dicho mi nombre. Lord, you have looked into my eyes, smiling, you have called my name. So goes the refrain of one of the most well-known and beautiful Latin American hymns. That single line poignantly expresses the core Christian belief so prominent in the Gospels and in the writings of St. Paul. God loved us first. You have looked into my eyes. Smiling, you have called my name. Before I look at Christ, Christ has already looked at me lovingly. Every other article of Christian faith, every theological statement is little more than a footnote to this central belief. My entire life is but a response to a lover whose very gaze and call have created me, named me, and compelled a response. Yet the reality of such a love is also the most unbelievable, literally incredible aspect of Christian faith. Unbelievable in the sense of a belief that truly governs and frames our entire lives so that we live as if Christ really does look upon us and smiling calls out our name. For this truth is folly to those of us who crave security, comfort, and power. Because we know that we are unworthy of such unconditional love, we must look after ourselves. Such a love is folly to those of us who know that our hopelessly broken world is unworthy. It never occurs to us that though unworthy, we might be made worthy. Or that more precisely, in God's eyes, the very question of worthiness is itself simply irrelevant, laughable, really. Overwhelmed by the sheer destructiveness of which we human beings are capable, we can only find the figure of Christ and his message at best quaint or at worst a cruel hoax. Oh, we might answer yes on those surveys that ask us if we believe in God, but our burgeoning weapons stockpiles, our xenophobic immigration laws, Compulsive consumerism, widespread chronic anxiety and depression and addictions of all kinds, all these 
suggest a very different belief, a very different answer to the question, do you believe in God? St. Paul's words are as true today as they were 2,000 years ago. Belief in God's unconditional, extravagant love is simply foolish. Except, ironically, for those persons who on the surface would appear to have the fewest reasons to hold such a confidence in God's love. As liberation theologian John Sobrino observes, quote, the poor have no problems with God. The classic question of theodicy, the quote-unquote problem of God, the atheism of protest, so reasonably posed by the non-poor, is no problem at all for the poor, who in good logic ought, of course, to be the ones to pose it, unquote. A great irony of our post-enlightenment world is that the rejection of God's love in the face of human suffering has come principally from those sectors of society most, quote unquote, blessed by economic prosperity and material security. It amuses me, wrote Jesuit philosopher Ignacio Ayacuria not long before he was martyred in El Salvador. It amuses me, he said, when people say, God has disappeared from the world because God has disappeared from Europe or from the European universities, or that the world has entered a post-Christian age and I don't know what else. It's possible that here in the West, yes, but this is not the world, unquote. Not only has religious faith not succumbed to the forces of secularization, but faith continues to thrive and grow particularly among the very peoples whose suffering is supposed to represent the most convincing argument against religious faith. What the poor have discovered is the liberating truth that contrary to so much of the empirical evidence, we are indeed loved. That life is the gift of an extravagant love and that life therefore is worth living no matter what? The struggle is worth it. Paradoxically, it's the very encounter with death, poverty, sin, and human powerlessness in all its guises, it's that very encounter that liberates us to fully embrace life itself. In the Christian tradition, the liberation and transformation offered us by God is symbolized above all in the figure of the crucified and risen Christ. And it's the poor who are the unlikely witnesses to the central claim of the Christian faith, God so loved the world. Be the problems of the truth of Christ what they may, writes Sobrino, quote, his credibility is assured as far as the poor are concerned, for he maintained his nearness to them to the end. In this sense, the cross of Jesus is seen as the paramount symbol of Jesus' approach to the poor and hence the guarantee of his indisputable credibility, unquote. The cross is the guarantee that he does in fact remain with us, that he does in fact walk with us even today. God's nearness, as symbolized by the crucified, is not the consequence of Christian belief so much as the foundational belief. When everyone else has abandoned us, even mother or father, Jesus Christ stays. As the great 20th century French philosopher Simone Weil observed, quote, the love of our neighbor in all its fullness simply means being able to say to him or her, what are you going through? On Calvary, Jesus Christ asks each one of us, what are you going through? Yet the anguish of Calvary is experienced as painful only because it's experienced in its relationship to perfect joy, reconciliation, communion. It's the more fundamental experience of God's loving presence, however temporary, tenuous, or fragile, that makes Calvary so unbearable. It's the promise of Easter that makes Good Friday so wrenching. In a postmodern society, 
where power and wealth only barely disguise an underlying silent desperation, where ubiquitous electronic gadgetry offers endless distractions from the harrowing void of everyday existence, where the strongest desire of teenagers is to become numb, whether by means of an alcoholic binge, a drug overdose, or a self-inflicted gunshot wound. In this world, it will ironically be left to the poor person to proclaim the truth of the crucified and risen Christ as the sign of God's extravagant love for each one of us. The danger, warns Simone Weil, the danger is not lest the soul should doubt whether there's any bread. The danger is lest by a lie the soul should persuade itself that it's not hungry, unquote. Therein lies despair. Consequently, it's not the satiated person, but the hungry person who can teach us about bread. It's not the conqueror, but the crucified victim who can teach us about the resurrection. Human beings are so made, observes Simone Weil, that the ones who do the crushing feel nothing. It's the person crushed who feels what's happening. Unless one has placed oneself on the side of the oppressed to feel with them, one cannot understand." Unquote. The crucified and resurrected Christ invited his own apostles to do just that, to see and touch his wounds, to place themselves on the side of the innocent victim. Now Thomas, one of the twelve called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and place my finger in the mark of the nails and place my hand in his side, I will not believe. Eight days later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. The doors were shut, but Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not be faithless, but believing. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God, John 20, 24 through 28. When the resurrected Christ appears to the cowering disciples, he shows them his wounds. Indeed, he demands that the disciples look at the wounds and insists in the case of Thomas that the unbelieving disciple put his hand in his side. What must Thomas have thought at that moment, or any of the other disciples in the room? What must have been running through their minds, or more importantly, through their hearts? They who only three days earlier had fled in terror from their friend as he was being dragged off to Calvary. Luke tells us they were startled and frightened upon seeing their friend walk into the room. No wonder the disciples were frightened. They thought they were seeing a ghost, a ghost from their past. Indeed, they must have been scared to death at the sight of the man they had just betrayed, who was now confronting them with the very visible concrete signs of that betrayal, those wounds. The disciples had probably assumed that now that Jesus was dead, they could put the past behind them chalk it up to a misguided idealism, and go on to live the lives of good, upstanding fishermen, tax collectors, etc. However, all of a sudden, into that seemingly secure room walks Jesus himself to remind his friends of that troubling past, to prick consciences that had just begun to find some equilibrium, some sense of closure, as we are wont to say today. Moreover, Jesus sticks his messy wounds in their faces. He doesn't say, let bygones be bygones or forgive and forget. Instead, he refuses to allow his disciples to forget what they had done to him. Jesus forces them to confront the painful consequences of their abandonment and betrayal. Look and see, 
put your hand here. Do not forget what you have done to me. Far from implying a forgetting of past suffering, Christ's bodily resurrection implies an acknowledgement that past injustices are never erased by future victories. Past suffering remains forever a part of the history of the resurrection. The wounds remain forever inscribed on the body of Christ. The resurrected Christ is and will always be also the crucified Christ. Like St. Paul, Christians will always preach a simultaneously crucified and risen Christ. As Nowen reminds us, in the Christian experience, sorrow and joy are never really separated. The restoration of the disciples' memory makes Jesus' approach in the upper room even more incredible. In the face of the disciples' betrayal and abandonment of Jesus, Jesus now approaches them with open arms, not with a, how dare you, but with a, peace be with you. Jesus invites them to become reconciled and sits down with them to break bread, to share a meal. The memory of innocent suffering inscribed on the body of the resurrected Jesus confronts the disciples not in order to condemn them, but precisely to invite them to become reconciled, to invite them to participate in Jesus' own resurrection. In the mirror that is Jesus' scarred body, the disciples see themselves convicted, forgiven, challenged to repent, and invited to become reconciled, transformed. In Jesus' wounds, Thomas recognizes his own woundedness. The disciples are not forgiven because they have first repented. No, they repent because they have first been forgiven. If the resurrection affirms the Father's ultimate refusal to abandon the Son to the forces of death, so too does it call for a reconciliation that transforms Christ's estrangement from his disciples into a renewed community. When the resurrected Christ presents himself to the disciples, he thus invites them to believe not just that he himself has been raised from the dead, but that a reconciled community of faith has now been made possible. If they will but acknowledge those enduring wounds and recognize themselves mirrored in the wounds, that is, if they accept Jesus' loving invitation to conversion. If it's truly the victory of life over death, then, the resurrection must vindicate and restore not just the life of the individual person, Jesus Christ, the resurrection must also vindicate and restore the relationships that themselves have helped define Jesus. The resurrection of Christ's body must be more than the restoration to life of an autonomous, isolated individual, it must be the resurrection of Cristo Compañero, Christ as companion. The resurrection of Emmanuel, God with us, emphasis on the with. The resurrection is the victory of companionship over abandonment. The victory of communion over estrangement. The act of solidarity with the wounded other is at the same time a reconstitution of our relationships now based upon an acknowledgement of our common woundedness, our common powerlessness, and our common dependence on the wounded and now risen Christ. It's also an acknowledgement of our complicity in the infliction of those wounds. But our fear will not allow us to acknowledge the fact that we're all wounded, we're all vulnerable, we're all ultimately powerless in the face of death. And that is why we continue to erect ever higher barriers between ourselves and the most wounded members of our society so that we will not really have to face their wounds and thus face ourselves. In the end, what we fear most is not those persons, but our very selves, our weak, fragile, vulnerable, wounded selves. So we avoid touching or even seeing the wounds.
We avoid risking the act of solidarity or companionship with the victims of history. Before we can love our neighbor, we must allow Christ to love us. Unless we can experience ourselves as loved unconditionally, we will inevitably continue to project our own self-hatred onto others and to blame them for what we in fact hate in ourselves. We can become truly reconciled with our neighbor only if we truly hear and believe the words that Christ addresses to each one of us. Peace be with you. You are loved in spite of what you have done to me. And we are transformed from persons who fear life because we fear death to persons fully alive precisely because we no longer need to fear our mortality, our powerlessness. The fear of life is simply the other side of the coin of the fear of death. If we fear death, we will inevitably fear life and we will inevitably end up inflicting death. If we fear death, we will end up killing in one way or another, those persons in our society, those poor and wounded persons whose own daily precarity in the face of death reminds us of our common powerlessness and is thus too much for us to bear. Jesus's loving gaze, his extravagant offer of unconditional mercy, his presence as our unfailing companion in life and in death is what vanquishes our fears and thus makes life possible. In Latin America, Henry Nouwen discovered that the fundamental form of human liberation is the liberation from fear, fear of the human other, fear of our very selves, and therefore fear of the God who has created us. We have become prisoners of our fear, he observed, as Henry recounted in 1985, quote, you know, when I was in Latin America and lived among the poor and oppressed people, I suddenly started to realize that they were not fearful people. Where I noticed hunger and oppression, torture and agony, I found more gratitude, more joy, more sense of peace. Yes, less fear than where those who have so much are living. And suddenly I realized that the other side of the oppression, the other side of the poverty of the South is the fear and the guilt and the loneliness and the anguish in the North. Somehow those two can never be separated, unquote. But Jesus speaks to us in the gospel with very strong words now and continued. It's a word sounding through the whole gospel that says, do not be afraid. That's what Gabriel was saying to Zachariah. That's what Gabriel was saying to Mary. That's what the angels were saying to the women at the tomb, be not afraid. And that's what the Lord himself says when he appears to his disciples do not be afraid, it is I. Do not be afraid, it is I." Unquote. The resurrection story in the Gospels does not stop, of course, with the risen Christ's encounter with the apostles in that closed room. The apostles are commanded to go to Galilee, the place where the renewed, reconciled community of faith will be revealed, the place where the fullness of Christ's resurrection will be unveiled, is a region familiar to them all. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead and behold, he is going before you to Galilee, Matthew 28, 7. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid, go and tell my disciples to go to Galilee and there they will see me, Matthew 28, 10. The identity and mission of the new ecclesia, the new community, the new church, are thus closely linked to Galilee. The renewed community will have Galilee as its birthplace. Like everything in the Bible, the choice of Galilee has theological significance. It's no mere coincidence that in the synoptic accounts, Jesus comes from Nazareth in Galilee, meets his end in Jerusalem, and finally returns to Galilee where he appears to the apostles after his resurrection. The theological significance ascribed to Galilee is rooted in the history, geography, and culture of that region. Geographically distant from the center of religious authority in Jerusalem, Galilee was a Jewish borderland contiguous with non-Jewish lands and peoples. Like all peoples living in geographical peripheries, 
Galilean Jews could not be as easily controlled as those living closer to the center of religious power. Therefore, the, or the orthodoxy of Galilean Jews was often suspect in the eyes of the religious elites and authorities in Jerusalem. The religious elites in Jerusalem could not conceive that God's word could be revealed among the Jews of the borderland. Search and you will see that no prophet is to rise from Galilee, John 7, 52. Yet it's precisely on the border where Jews rub shoulders with non-Jews that God takes on human flesh. The way to a new reconciled community runs through the Galilean borderland where the risk of racial, cultural, and religious impurity that had historically been perceived as a threat to the faith is instead revealed as the cradle of new life. Yes, the way to authentic community and liberation runs first through the upper room where the disciples whose faith had disintegrated at Calvary are confronted with the ironically frightening question, why are you frightened? But if they are to discover the full meaning of the resurrection, the disciples must venture into the risky territory of Galilee. Again, the real enemy of belief is not unbelief, but fear. Be not afraid of putting your hand in Jesus' side. Be not afraid of proclaiming my Lord and my God in the face of innocent suffering. But also, be not afraid of seeking Christ's glorified body there where his liberating presence is revealed on the borders between Jews and Gentiles, between believers and unbelievers, between the ungodly and the godly, between the pure and impure. This is the Christ that Henry Nouwen discovered when he risked going to the borderlands of Latin America and then the large community. Be not afraid of the borderland, for that is where we will see him. That is where the church will be born. Indeed, Jesus' parallel commands to place your hand in my side and to go to Galilee have at least this much in common. Both of these commands strike at the very heart of our human fragility because both of these commands imply that if we are to recognize the crucified and risen Lord, we must risk defilement. We must touch the untouchable. We must touch the wounds of our world. But it's a risk well worth taking because Jesus has assured us that there you will see me. Faith in the resurrection demands that we reject the assumption that no prophet is to rise from Galilee. Instead, Jesus asks us precisely to venture into Galilee, not only to proclaim the good news, but to discover it there. Be not afraid. There you will see me. Christ empowers us to overcome the fear of discovering the good news among unfriendly peoples, among the quote-unquote impure. Be not afraid of the wounds on the body of the risen Christ. Be not afraid of the so-called impurity of the borderland, for there you will be liberated from your fears. There you will encounter the God who loved you first. There Christ awaits. Lord, through the eyes of your poor, you yourself have looked into my eyes, smiling, you have called my name. And I myself am liberated to look into the eyes of the poor because you, O Lord, have first smiled at me and called out my name. This is the good news echoed in Henry Nouwen's own words to us. Love one another because God has loved you first. You and I have to keep believing that we can only be free if we are in touch with that original love, that first love, that total, unconditional, unlimited love. It's that love that will set you free. Thank you. Thank you.